Uh, I'll go first. Thank you very much, Governor, for your very uh, comprehensive uh, speech. And, uh, you know, one issue you didn't mention was uh, gender-based violence, violence against women and girls. And uh, actually, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor both addressed that very clearly. So I just wanted to give you, ask, ask, give you the opportunity to comment on that very important issue. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Prof. I'll have to refer to my phone. Uh, as you know, I'm still Deputy Chair of... Um, um, the Gender Equity and Women's Empowerment Committee, which is what it's called now. Um, and I've actually got a report uh, back from some of our, some of our uh, stakeholders. Now, so far, in terms of Saab and that sorcery-related violence and gender-based violence, and as you know, I took a bill to the floor. We've got three perpetrators who have been sentenced to life as a result of that work. Two other perpetrators have 25 years. One has got 24 years, and another one has got five. Now, we've got 64 awaiting trial. That's part of the work we've done. So getting beyond just the advocacy and which is all very necessary I think that perpetrators need to be punished perpetrators need to know that there's a limit to the things they can and can't do so one of the things we've been focusing on uh, myself and Governor Parkop who is the chair of the committee is to focus on the nuts and bolts of getting things done so that our women and girls feel safe in the community um, I used to complain a lot about the fact that we weren't doing enough, but I'm happy to see that some of the work we've done through the committee, we now have a dedicated gender uh, specialists in the police force around the country, and if there aren't any, we're getting them in. We've got provincial governments to start funding those offices, so we've come a long way in the, in the last five years uh, with that work. So again, beyond the advocacy, getting perpetrators punished, I think is important. Because the thing that's missing in Papua New Guinea, in my view, is justice. Once people know that justice is going to be served, and I, I love this idea that a female constable in Australia can arrest a very powerful minister of state in Papua New Guinea and <laughs> put him before the law. I don't think any Papua New Guinean powerful men are going to face courts given our current system and given our current level of policing. So for me personally, I think justice is an indispensable part of this whole equation, not just for gender-based violence, but for every other crime that's perpetrated in our country. Thank you. Yes, uh, Professor Pillai. Thank you, Honorable Governor. Thank you for the wonderful talk. It's not just a talk, not, just ins not only inspiring, you are now looking at the future. You mentioned about everything, but you touched and, touched and went about one, one important thing, that's a higher education. We need people like you with the great thinking and great qualification. Unfortunately, every successive government, they have completely ignored higher education, starting with bachelors, masters, and PhD. You can see, when you say masters and PhD, people say, we'll go to Australia, or UK, or US. Why not Papua New Guinea? Because we are not building the capacity locally. What is your uh, take on that one? Th these people with the high knowledge they can make the difference. We are seeing the same problem again and again. I am in the country for the last 25 years. I'm hearing the same problem again and again. We need a different thinking and with a different knowledge and skill. What is your take on that one? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. I, I'm, I'm, I might be a little bit biased because I know many of you. So let me just say that uh, as a disclaimer. I think that knowledge generated that is environment specific is important. Whilst I appreciate that it's important that we do 
uh, for those that go out and do their masters and PhD qualifications overseas. I think it's also important that we do that here. And one of the things that uh, myself and others, I'm on the NRI Council as a board member, and we've argued for, for example, research grants so that we can start doing some of that work in country, so that you do provide those opportunities for research in country. I think part of the problem comes from not being able to fund the studies so, and, and to fund those, those particular qualifications. So um, we are working on it from a different angle. And as you know, I think this year, government has allocated some funds for, for research so that we can, yeah, yeah, one million. Now. Again, they give you one million. They gave us one million too for economy. There you go. So we've got to do a lot more. I agree with you. Uh, and, and again, we've got to recognize that knowledge that is generated. And one of the things, uh, Professor uh, Kalowin is sitting here. I'm really keen on research knowledge generated from some of our indigenous species that may have um, commercial value, not just that, but perhaps humanitarian value for the planet into the future. And as you know, we haven't done that work. So totally agree with you. Thank you. Uh, yes, from right in the middle there. Thank you and good morning, everyone. My name is Logia Now I'm a researcher with the PNG National Research Institute. Now, I'm of the view that economies of scale are important for Papua New Guinea. So my question to um, Honorable Governor is, the special economic zones, do you think it's, um, do you think it's a step in the right direction? Um, and also, do you think it's, it's a step in the right direction? It's providing the right incentives for investors, but at the same time in an environment where we need a tax revenue, especially given the tax con large tax, tax concessions that have been given. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you. Um, when you look at the way we set up, for example, the mining and the oil and gas operations, in my view, they're special economic zones, if you look at the legislation, the specific legislation that goes with each one. So in a way, I think we've been doing this, but perhaps not so much in some of the other industries, downstream processing and whatever not that are being considered now. So in terms of calling it a special economic zone, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, but I, I'd put it again, work backwards. What do we need? We need jobs. We need to see the picture from a larger perspective. So I think we need a policy that deals with this, the issue. And that policy needs to be directed towards achieving certain outcomes. For me personally, I want the jobs. So if I want the jobs, I think the policy that deals with these special economic zones needs to point back to jobs. So if we sacrifice, like, I don't think it's a good idea to keep giving government lots and lots of money. In the last five years, we have had record budgets and very low impact in the community. So giving more money in Texas to politicians is probably not a good idea, in my view. But if we can organize commercial activities in such a way that, for example, we have a special operator with their own terms and conditions, 20 years tax-free, whatever it is, operating somewhere in Papua New Guinea, and they employ 5,000 people. That's 5,000 Papua New Guineans feeding their families, putting their kids through school, buying their own homes. I would gladly sacrifice 20 years of uh, company, income, uh, company taxes for the 5,000 jobs. Because as a government, you then collect other taxes. You're collecting taxes from GST and, and so these 5,000 people that are making the money and spending that money in that community, you end up taxing them anyway. And if they spend the money and someone else spends the money, well, you end up taxing that same kina two or three times. So I think we need to expand our thinking beyond and not just call it a special economic zone. 
I, I would like to see it as special exemptions so that we can get the things that we want. I, I hope that answers your question. So I'm not a big fan of calling them like, I don't like the idea of having a hotel in Port Mosby that's a special economic zone. There's nothing special about that. But if you were to bring in a manufacturing plant to produce glass or to smelt aluminum or something like that, and it's going to create 5,000 jobs, and you give that a special exemption under law for the 5,000 jobs and the livelihoods of those Papua New Guineans, I think that needs to be the way we do it. And I'm not sure how it's being done at the moment, so let me just say that. Thank you. Thank you. From this side, yes, please. Thank you to Governor Alan Bird, uh, Dr. Amanda Watson from Australian National University. Uh, you're a wonderful orator. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. There was just one word I couldn't understand. It was five or ten minutes before the end of your speech and you said, as you know, I'm keen on and it sounded like you were saying blog roll or something like that. I, I think a few of us were wondering what, you were, what the word was and what you meant. Ap apologies, we, that was the one thing we just didn't catch. Thank you. Uh, that was a block grant. I'm sorry, it could have been the microphone. Now, as you know, in Australia, the federal government uses a block grant system with the state governments. So you, you've actually got a small federal government and you've got large state governments. That's a deliberate design in Australia. So the federal government designs policy, monitors policy, and then you have inspections going on in the, in the states to make sure that they're spending the money to achieve the outcomes that I guess all of Australia wants. So I'm arguing for the same system that the people of Australia currently enjoy. And the people of the United States, the people of India, the people of China and Europe, and basically every, every other country except us. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, put that away. Chinese proverb, give a man a fish, or give a person a fish, and the person will be dependent on that fish for life. You teach a person how to fish, and the person will fish for life. And we break that dependency syndrome that Papua New Guinea is still strong 49 years on since independence. Governor, I didn't hear your thoughts on education, sorry. Coming from an education background, I'd like to hear your thoughts. I had a question from Prof. Pillai on higher education. Like you, I'm concerned about the basics up, the top down, uh, bottom up approach. I like your transformation leadership. And I'm proud to be a civic woman and a civic academic, and I'm proud that you're my governor. <laughs> governor, sorry, Mr. Bird. What is your thought on basic education, curriculum design, development, aligning with, when I say basic, that's early childhood, primary, secondary, and up to the tertiary space. I've been an educator in Papua New Guinea for more than 32 years. 15 years in the Teaching Service Commission, and about 22 years here at UPNG. And, it's the same question. Yesterday I attended an education session. It's about training. We're still doing training 49 years on. Yes, it does help. That empowerment you were talking about when wealth creation to the village people, to the local. We need that in every sector in Papua New Guinea. What are your thoughts on aligning the curriculum so that when you get students at UPNG and other tertiary institutions, they have critical, you know, learning, critical skills, critical research, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. I, I think it's, uh, we made a change some years back, but the early system we had where kids were streamed either to the technical areas or, or to academia, and it really comes back to the standards that we want. I know the universities are now struggling with uh, things like literacy levels, understanding, being able to write, uh, and obviously we've lost it at the lower level. So I just think we, we need to bring back those standards. That, that's all we need to do. And then to be clear about what we are building these young people for. I always ask the question, what are we educating our people for, especially the young ones? So, for example, if we know, like, 
the Philippine approach. The F Philippines are training their people to work in other countries. They've got a production line that produces human beings that are work ready for other countries. I mean, do we want that or do we want a mix? These are, I think, policy discussions that need to take place from you academics. And you need to tell us, because you have to understand, there aren't too many highly educated people in parliament. Uh, there might be a few, but you know, when we become politicians, we tend to think differently. But that's another matter entirely. Uh, I'm on camera now, so many of my colleagues won't be happy with me. Uh, but the thing is, that one of the things I didn't say, and it was in my notes, is that I would like to see empirical evidence feed into policy so that we are then driving, again, being committed, having that stable policy environment to drive that policy so that we get the outcomes. Again, working backwards from the problem. So I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, we'll get it right at the top in the corner. And My name is Eliab Sangundi. Uh, I would like to, before I ask my question, one of the things that governor for ECP that he talked about is, he mentioned more about the agriculture. Papua Guinea is a country that, that have uh, large land mass and customary land owns 97% of the land in Papua New Guinea and state owns 3%. And you mentioned something about agriculture. And I believe the missing link of our country's development is the agriculture because agriculture is a thing that was in the beginning the God said about cultivation. Cultivation, it means to work the land. So what he talks about agriculture, it blew my mind away. Because agriculture is one of the answer for our country because we have land that are sitting idle, not productive. To our country. My question is: As you, you as a best alternative prime uh, opposition prime minister of Papua New Guinea, my question is: mm -hmm. My question is: What is your, what according to your observation, what is your? What is the core problem of our country? It is the corruption or it is the leadership? Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, let me just say that we have many problems, many challenges. Um, and I think I've mentioned some of them. The reason why I talk about agriculture is that, you know, man lotu, time you ask him a man question, he'll default to the Bible. Uh, I've, I've been working agriculture ever since I was a young man. So it's in my blood. It speaks to me. It's something that I'm more comfortable in. So I try to explain things using agricultural terms because So when you ask someone who is a politician, they'll, they'll speak to you in politics speak. Huh? We all have our own different languages and nuances. So I, I hope that explains that. Now, coming back to what you say, I think land is critical, but there are ways you can get around it. For example, the cocoa people that we target in East Sipik, they're all smallholders, so they're doing it on their own land. They're not doing it on state land. So what we try to do is, and it comes back to your basic, uh, how shall I say, your basic, um, requirements for production to take place in an economy. You need land, you need labor, you need capital, and you need entrepreneurship and skills, right? Amongst other things, but the basic stuff is there. Uh, some of you might recall, um, some years back, uh, I was fortunate to be part of a, uh, doing a policy for government under uh, Charles Abel, who was minister at the time. George is here, George Bopi. You're a doctor now, aren't you? Uh, congratulations, yeah. We, we work together on this document, and it's called a Strategy for Responsible Sustainable Development. And in there, we talk about some of our strategic assets. Obviously, land is one of them. And so what I've tried to do in ECPIC is to target that using an existing government policy. So even though I haven't talked about the policy, what we are doing is actually aligned to the policy. 
And it, it just makes sense. What's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. There might be a hundred ways to arrive at the destination. You just need to pick one and pick the easiest one. All right? But the same principle that we've adopted for agriculture can be applied in, in a variety of, of industries. You just have to build that environment where people feel comfortable to come and invest. And that environment, again, includes things like, for example, I mentioned cost of power. I didn't talk about all the other costs. You know, the difficulties of doing business in the country. They're all listed already. So our challenge would be to look at all of the impediments and find solutions. You either go around them or, like for example, if we wanted to do large-scale large agriculture, and I've got an investor right now that needs half a million hectares of land so they can plant trees to produce paper. Why are they doing that? Well, they're just looking for space to grow trees. Their existing suppliers are not able to well, they're worried about the security of their supplies. So they need an alternative source. It's kind of like vanilla. When people are short of vanilla, they look for security. They look for an alternative supply. It's just business. It's just commerce. It has realities. And business people just want to solve problems. That's all they do. They just solve problems. So if your country has an opportunity, then they come. And they look at everything. And then they figure out, how do I get access to half a million hectares of land so I can grow eucalyptus? You've got eucalyptus growing out here, those trees. And feed it through a mill and produce pulp so I can keep the largest paper factory in the world operating. The question for us now is how do we create that environment where, for example, our challenge is we don't want the landowner to lose the land. Mania like in DIY. So how do we marry the two together so that we get the best of both worlds? We get 100,000 jobs, so our people are working, making money, looking after their families, paying for their kids' education, all those things that we, we desire. At the same time, this company picks up um, pulp for their paper mill. They're happy. The government collects tax. The government's happy, so we can go and bribe all of you and win the next election and come back again. <laughs> Everyone's happy. I think that's what we are trying to achieve. Agriculture is just a tool to an outcome. That's what it is. Thank you. We'll take one from uh, the middle. My name is Alfred Talingapur. Um, I think uh, Dr. Sauce is here too, so Willie and I think uh, Emmanuel Gore. Um, uh, uh, Governor, sorry, thank you for your appearance today and also the university. My, my question is, uh, you know, the main problem that is facing the country is illiteracy. Everything boils down to illiteracy, to the intelligence, to the highest level. So I'm, I'm, I'm just asking from the, uh, one, one good example from a rugby league perspective and, you know, in board in some of these primary schools. I see that most of our, most of our, even the LLG presidents, uh, governor would know this, most of our, our board members, they are illiterate. So the governor can be intelligent in pulling all resources down to, to roll out all the programs. Unfortunately, because of illiteracy, they mismanage the, the fundings. And it goes in all aspects. So if the provinces can establish their own universities, so we have a lot of lecturers who can go back and uh, at least ramp up intelligence right across the nation, then we can see development for the next 100 years. Thank you. Is it, is it viable? Thank you. I think the, the best way to do that, I'm, I'm not a big fan of building new institutions. I think that we should make our existing institutions better. Um, the way government budgeting works at the moment is that if there's funding for, say, the higher education sector, and you've experienced this, and a new university is built, well, you just get less money because they're directing the money to this one. It doesn't mean it gets a whole new budget. It's the same in provinces. If we get a new district, our funding doesn't go up. You just divide the same you know, basket amongst more children. That, that's all that happens. So. 
Uh, there's things like distance education, which I'm a big fan of. Um, in ECP, because I've got about 5,000 teachers, 760 schools, it's crazy. But we're not getting the quality out the other end. So we're developing a, a and I'm trying to get Starlink so that we can, we can deliver content, uh, you know, electronically down to some of these schools. Um, because when a teacher at Keram decides to take off and go to town for two months, we don't even know that these kids don't have a teacher. So we need some kind of electronic way using technology to track what these teachers are doing. We want to, and we've already started with our high school kids. We're registering them. Uh, we've got Brandy now, which is one of our top schools. We've been working with Pasam. Pasam is coming up. And we're trying to track our kids through. We're calling it, we started off calling it Civic Genius, but uh, the young person who's developing it for us is, is now called it Kumul Genius. Um, but to me, I think the internet provides an amazing possibility for us to educate more people. I mean, I don't know what people do with these things. You know, my first laptop was, uh, weighed about seven kilos. My first laptop. It was like a little briefcase that you carried around. It, only, it could only store 760 kilobytes of data. And the processing speed was, you know, you'd wait, it'd go You've <laughs> You'd be waiting for it, and we use floppy disks. This thing in my hand <laughs> is about a million times faster than that laptop that I had 30 years ago. I learn a lot more using this tool than from any other medium. Every book I want to read is here. Anything technical I want to understand, any information, whether it's agriculture, economics, finance, it's all here. And so what I'm trying to do in my province is to get these devices down to the schools so that the kids have access. And instead of looking for boyfriends and girlfriends or whatever it is they do with these things, they can, they can use them to learn. They can use them to learn. Now, there's a danger in it, but here's the thing. We've got, what, 17 million people? Maybe 10 million are marginally educated, like uh, what you're suggesting. We can't reach them using our current method of teaching. We've got to find an innovative way of doing it. All of the knowledge and discipline exists in the University of Papua New Guinea, the University of Technology in Leh, PAU, Divine Word. Um, I would want to limit the number of institutions so you can maintain standards and quality. Uh, I'm not saying that if we build a new university, it's going to be low quality. All I'm saying is it's going to take time to get the governance and all those other things in place. I'm just being practical. So I think reaching out using uh, you know, technology so you can get learning modules to places like MAPRIC. We already have a learning center in MAPRIC where I think UPNG is there, Unitech, and other universities are using to teach. That's what I would like to do, but at the same time, getting people to understand that just because you come up, member, you stop learning, or you, you reverse your learning. It shouldn't work like that. You should be willing to continue learning. And I think it's incumbent on leaders to continue learning. We need to know enough so that we are making the right decisions. So whether you prime minister or minister or governor or LLG president or ward member, you need to be actively learning. Because if we are actively learning, we can be more receptive to new ideas, doing things better. Because no one person knows everything. The problem arises when they stop learning and they hold these positions. Every country in the world, they look to their leaders for leadership. Now, if there is an insufficient level of understanding of whoever is in charge, I don't think a prime minister or a governor should turn around and say, oh, look, I'm not an economic genius. I don't think that's good enough. If you're not an economic genius, well, pick up something and learn so you can understand when you're dealing with e economics. Oh, I'm not an agricultural genius. I am self-taught in agriculture. 
I never went to agricultural college. Everything I know in agriculture, I taught myself. And I learned from devices like this. Learning knowledge is all around you. You just have to be willing. That's all. So put a demand on your ward member. Put a demand on your LLG president. Suppose him less low, kiss him school now, helping people blow you. Well, you force him to do it. <laughs> Can you go back to that name earlier? Yeah, I'm Laurie from Sub National. And in my feature, you can see that I, the jeans that I have, this is my platform to vertical up. My question is as, as a Melanesia, you know. Is it education and uh, uh, the skill base uh, that you have to dwell on that, that will bring about good livelihood to us? Is it that, uh, that you see? I'm just analyzing you how, how you pick up your leadership to give a good uh, uh, livelihood to our citizens here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Well, at the village level, what you want to do is just upskill people so that they utilize their resources better. That's all you want to do. If they want to go further with that, then I think they need to have options and choices so they can make those decisions themselves. I think empowering ordinary people is really about giving them choices and options. An empowered individual will make very different decisions to someone who is not. So whether that empowerment be in terms of earning an income in the village, or having a better education, all of that empowerment just gives you access to better choices. That's all it does. Educating a woman gives her access to better choices. Uh, so too, the same applies to an ordinary villager. I'll give you a very basic concept of this. One of the struggles I had when we were trying to do cocoa, and I was trying to get people to produce what we call cocoa clones, because these are pot borer resistant. We have a pot borer problem in Isipik. And we have to replace something like, I think it's 150 million cocoa trees. We have to replace them. Now to do that using a conventional method, if you're buying seedlings, it's going to cost you five kina for one. So that's already up, you know, almost a billion kina. We can't afford that. So we had to get smart. We had to train people to produce their own clones. So all we did was give them the, the nursery. That's what we did. Okay. Now, when we started, there were only about 12 people in the entire province, a province of about 800,000 people, who could produce clones. Today, there's probably 50,000 CPICs who can produce clones. Some of them are actually in school. School kids do this better than adults. So when we started, one, one Budwood nursery can produce around uh, 200,000 seedlings a year. All right? We've got more than 600 of them. And because the plants that are already in the ground, ECPIC now, this year we are going to produce around 10 million clones. We are the only province that has the capacity to produce around 30 million clones a year. But we had to build that, and we had to be smart about how we built it, and we had to use ordinary people with no skills to build it. So when I talk about skill. I'm talking about from that all the way up to training someone to, I guess, be a helicopter engineer, you know, or to be a medical technician or whatever it is. Again, start from the need, work backwards. My struggle was I started off in a poor province, low income base. People had no income. What do you do? Rotem clear nastapia. Mi plakatim busta sol na wogim. So, of course, we had to fight Cocoa Board. You couldn't produce a clone in Papua New Guinea unless you were licensed by the Cocoa Board. Well, I'm a CPIC, so we can get fairly aggressive. A CPIC's in this room, no. I'm, I was sitting between two of them in case you... <laughs> so I said to the Cocoa Board, don't come to my province. Just don't come at all. Stay in lay. Come when we are finished. Because I wanted to liberalize the knowledge. I didn't want it locked up in an institution. What's the point of having knowledge if people can't use it? You couldn't even own a Budwood garden without a license from the Cocoa Board. 
I'm like, what's this nonsense? Don't come to Sipik. Just don't come until we are finished. When you want to empower people, you've got to be hard about it. You've got to be cruel about it. Because one of the sad things I see in Papua New Guinea is that when a Papua New Guinean gets an important position and becomes a big man, we try to flex our little muscles and squeeze everybody out. Have you noticed that? You walk up to a government office, now you can travel a professor and you ask for something, they say, sit down. <laughs> you go and wait in line at the back. And if they don't like you, well, they don't even save you. We, we've got these little inferiority complexes that tend to overly display themselves once we get a big position. Now. You know, we need a lot more humility in this country, real humility. <laughs> to me, it's about the ordinary citizen in my province. If they can be empowered in whatever way, whether it be education, using their land, using their fisheries resources, whatever it is, so that they can have options and choices, like you said, they can catch their own fish, feed themselves, pay their own school fees. You know, I, I, I bumped into uh, um, the guy, well, Mr. Seddon, who is now in charge of New Guinea, and he told me, the fourth commercially viable airport in Papua New Guinea is WeWeg. It's the fourth commercially viable one that's making money for them. How did that happen? That happened because ordinary folks in the village had two coins in their pocket that they could rub together. That's how it happened. Why are ships waiting to birth? Why does ECP need a new wharf? It's simple. People need the demand for goods and services have increased. Why is fuel running out? Well, why, why are our roads getting smashed? We have too many cars on the road. I see these nice roads that people post on Facebook, man, nice little roads straight there, just winding through the hills, not a single car on them. You come to East Epic, our roads are smashed, cars are nose to tail. Too many vehicles. Like I said, good problems to have. And they, these problems come around when you empower people. Yes, and I think, I think that'd be a, a pretty nice way to end all of this, but one hand is short up. So that's the last one, I think. Yeah, so please, uh, right in the middle there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Governor, can I take you away from the citizens' uh, advocacy and, and bring you to the political level? Um, at that political space, at that uh, parliamentary level, the strategy that you talked about, medical strategy, and you loved about it, are you already advocating it at that space? And if you are, what is your assessment of the success rate in, the last, in this remaining term of parliament? Sorry, can you repeat that? Um, I'm saying, I'm asking you the medical strategy that you talked about earlier on that you loved about the medical strategy. Try, yes, and at the political at the uh, political level, at, uh, are you already advocating that? And if you are, what is your success rate um, in this remaining term of parliament? That's a good question. Okay, <clears throat> um, the first thing we did was improve governance. Prior to that, we had a lot of misbehavior amongst the people that manage the health space. So I became chairman at the time, and we started to clean it up, and we instituted processes. The processes were already there. I didn't create them. We just made sure that we followed them. So the first thing we did was employ someone highly competent and honest to run the organization. That was the first thing we did. And he's someone who when I think of him, he's a mentor, someone I really respect. His name is Mark Maludu. So we ended up with Mark. And then when it was time for me to go, because I was running for the elections to become governor, I had to pick a replacement chairman. So I picked the person running the biggest business in ECP, the chairman of South Sea Tuna. I said, you've got 4,000 workers, you need the hospital. You, you come and take my place. So we ended up with a good chairman. Today, our chairman is uh, uh, 
brilliant person by the name of Pastor Max Manimbi. So we are maintaining that level of good governance within the health space. When they went out to recruit, all the CIPIC said, I'm walk blah mibla. Mibla CIPIC must kiss him. You know, CIPICs can be fairly aggressive. The good thing is I'm a CIPIC too. Max is a CIPIC too. We had CIPICs in there who wanted the best for our people. So they picked someone from West New Britain. And he's brilliant. So he knows how to run the facility. I mean, he worked it out. Like, for instance, when, when the prime minister goes around and gives 5 million kina checks to members of parliament, uh, we had uh, Prime Minister O'Neill come and give 5 million to some of our open members to build hospitals. So we had a meeting. Uh, the CEO rang me and said, Governor, can you get the members so I can talk to them? So I organized the meeting. And the CEO said to them, I can get you World Bank funding to build your district hospitals. One member of parliament, member for Ambunti Dragikia, stood up with his 5 million kina check and just gave it straight to the um, CEO. Ambunti District Hospital got built in two years. It's complete, it's running now. It's got four doctors. <laughs> some of the hospitals where the member is trying to build it himself, uh, they've been building for 12 years now, some of them. <laughs> so just as an example, get good, competent people to run these things. And Whatever you do, don't pick your one talk, because that's the worst thing you can do. And this is what I tell governors, huh? Don't pick your campaign manager to go and be there, because campaign manager and by talk. Ah, me stop, now you stop. <laughs> you got dinner or me, uh, finish, he'll run the thing down, kill it, and you lose the next election. So don't ever, you know, rule of thumb, don't ever pick your one talks for these things. Pick competent people who are going to give value back. And that's what we did. So. Having the right people there, uh, you know, our clinical facility cost 210 million to build. It's one of the cheapest facilities in the country. Yet it's the only place in the country where you can have laser eye surgery. You want to you fix your eyes? Come to WeWay.